Before we get into today's case, I want to say a huge thank you to Simply Safe for partnering with me on today's video. There's no safe like Simply Safe. Hello everyone and happy Halloween week. I found today's case while searching for something spooky to cover and while it's not my typical Halloween content, I still found this case really interesting. The way this case was discovered will blow your mind and how the entire thing played out is just wild. The thought of mistaking someone's real life dead body for a Halloween decoration sounds like something straight out of a movie, but it's not. That is exactly what happened in today's case. And once you hear the details, I think you'll be just as shocked as I was. But before we get into a case that can make anyone feel uneasy, I want to discuss one way that I like to keep myself safe, and that is with Simply Safe. As so many of you may already know, I am so very passionate about personal protection, and one of the most effective ways to protect your safety is through home security. Throughout my life, there have been so many times where I wished I had home security. My house had been broken into before while I was sleeping, which was a terrifying reality to wake up to. If I had a home security system, I would have been woken up and the authorities would have been called right away. For that reason and so many others is why I started using Simply Safe. Simply Safe is a comprehensive security system for the entire home with advanced sensors and cameras to detect threats from break-ins, fires, floods, and more. They're a combination of sensors which can detect windows breaking, doors opening, and motion if there's someone inside or outside your home makes me feel so much more at ease. Whether I'm at home and want to protect myself or if I'm away and want to make sure my property and pets are safe, I know that Simply Safe has my back. Simply Safe offers exclusive 24-7 live guard protection and the smart alarm indoor camera. If set off, Simply Safe's expert agents will act within five seconds of receiving the alarm signal and they will rapidly assess the situation and take immediate steps to ensure your and your family's safety. Their agents can use the indoor camera to see and even speak to intruders in real time, stopping them in their tracks, which honestly is my favorite feature. I set up my Simply Safe system in my own home completely by myself. It was very easy to set up. They provide clear, simple, step-by-step -step instructions but they do also offer professional installation as well for those of you who prefer the expertise of a pro. The other thing I love about Simply Safe is that unlike traditional home security systems, Simply Safe never locks you in to a long-term contract or charge hidden fees. Simply Safe earns your business day by day by keeping you safe and satisfied, never locking you in. Professional monitoring plans are available for less than $1 per day, which is less than half the cost of traditional security systems. Give yourself a sense of control and ease knowing that your home is protected no matter where you are. You can save 20% on your system and get your first month free when you sign up for Fast Protect Monitoring at simplysafe.com slash Rachel Shannon. Simply Safe is risk-free, so if you don't love it, you can return it. Once again, visit simplysafe.com slash Rachel Shannon to get 20% off plus your first month free when you sign up for Fast Protect monitoring. Thank you again so much to Simply Safe for partnering with me on today's video. There's no safe like Simply Safe. With that being said, let's get into the case. Today, we're going to be discussing the tragic case of Rebecca Cade. Rebecca Cade was born November 26, 1983 in Detroit, Michigan. It was said that Rebecca had a bit of a rough life at the start. She was born with fetal alcohol syndrome, which affected her development as she grew into adulthood. Then, when Rebecca was four years old, she was adopted by Mike and Cynthia Cade, and she had a sister named Jane, as well as two brothers, David and Jacob. After being adopted, her parents said that they raised her as if she were their own. She obviously faced many challenges throughout her childhood, but her parents did everything they could to provide a safe, loving home for Rebecca. At the time of her death, 31-year-old Rebecca was living in Chillicothe, Ohio. Despite her diagnosis and despite her troubles in life, Rebecca was described as being kind-hearted, sweet, and a free spirit. She was known to be calm and collected, an easy person to be around. Now, it was stated that even though Rebecca was a full-grown adult, she did have the mentality of a child, having a really hard time adjusting to life and being responsible. She was known to frequently use drugs and alcohol, and she got herself involved with a rough crowd and spent time on the streets. She truly struggled with her habit, and even though her family tried to be there for her, tried to support her through everything, she never really took their help. She stayed on the streets and spent time in and out of jail for various drug-related charges. By the age of 29 or 30, Rebecca actually found herself pregnant, giving birth to a beautiful baby boy, Brian. However, Brian too was born with fetal alcohol syndrome. 
From what I could tell, Rebecca tried her best to care for him for the first few months of his life, but she ultimately realized that she just simply couldn't care for a baby. So, Brian was ultimately removed from her care and placed with Denise Hughes, the sister of the baby's father. Rebecca did still care about her baby though, checking in with Denise several times per day. She would also stop by from time to time, offering to buy him diapers and food. She wanted to make sure she could still be in Brian's life despite being unable to be a mother. This case starts on October 13th, 2015. That morning, men working at an American electric power construction site in Chillicothe noticed what looked like a Halloween decoration hanging off of a chain-linked fence in the area. The town of Chillicothe was known for being heavily decorated during Halloween season, so these men saw what they thought was just a gruesome-looking, realistic-looking mannequin set out for the spooky season. However, by around 8.30 a.m., another man in the area was walking his dog when his dog discovered a random cell phone, driver's license, and a shoe. This prompted the man to call police, who arrived shortly after to search the area. As they started their search, they noticed that chain link fence with the so-called mannequin on it. But as they got closer, they realized that this was no Halloween decoration. It was a real human body of a woman who had been brutally beaten and murdered. As officers inspected the body, they were able to put together a picture of what they believed happened to this woman and how she ended up hanging from that chain link fence. Based on the initial examination, it was clear that the woman had been attacked and she fought her attacker as hard as she could. She had injuries to her hands, arms, and face. Her jaw and nose were bruised and broken, and she had a total of five cuts and two deep stab wounds on her face, making her almost unrecognizable. It was clear that this woman desperately tried to get away from her attacker. There was a trail of blood starting where she most likely ran from her attacker, leading to where her body was hanging. Based on that, it looked like the woman tried jumping the fence to get away but the sleeve of her shirt caught on the fence, causing her to get stuck and suspending her there about two feet above the ground. This is where she ultimately succumbed to her injuries. Near her body, police also found a rock about the size of a large orange or grapefruit, which had blood on it. Of course, the thought was that this could be the murder weapon. Like I said, at first, police had a hard time identifying this woman because of how badly her face had been beaten, However, they were ultimately able to identify the woman as being 31-year-old Rebecca Cade. News of Rebecca's death sent the town of Chillicothe into a panic. She had actually been the sixth woman in the area to go missing or be found dead since May of 2014. There were whispers of a possible serial killer active in the area. Each of these women had similar lifestyles. They all used drugs. Some of them were involved with sex work. Of course, when you have a string of victims going missing or turning up dead, all who have similar lifestyles like that, you're going to wonder if the same person could be responsible. The population here in Chillicothe is 23,000, a small community where you would think everyone knows everyone's business. But the disappearances of these women have the community feeling uncertain. Investigators and residents alike asking the questions, what's happening to these Chillicothe women and is there a serial killer on the loose? It's a dark mystery in this small town of Chillicothe. Six women missing, four found dead, all since May of last year. Found a woman's body in a creek. All four bodies found near water. The first to be found, 30-year-old Tamika Lynch, who was found dead in Paint Creek. Her mother today, still heartbroken. It's not a white man of her. It's not right. My new threw away like a piece of trash. Her cause of death, a multiple drug overdose. But the facts show she was dead even before she was in the water. Circumstances similar to several other women gone missing, some in the same networks. They've all lived similar lifestyles. We know that they've had uh, drug addictions, um, heroin being the drug of choice for most of them, also um, some prostitution issues um, in their lives. Officer Bud Lytle has been investigating this case since the beginning. In the 19 years he's worked here, this is 
a first. It's shocked our community, in all honesty. It's, it's one of those things, uh, we, we've never had anything like this here. The latest breakthrough, a body found over the weekend. This one of 26-year-old Tiffany Sayer. She was alive six weeks ago. This is not the closure we wanted. We wanted her home. The unsettling feeling of not having answers. There's a serial killer out there, and, and that's a legitimate question. And again, it's not something that we've ruled out. Right now, Chillicothe Police and the Ross County Sheriff's Office are partnering with the FBI to form a task force. Force. They say right now the best information they have is coming from the community and they're urging anyone with any information to call police. However, shortly after the discovery of Rebecca's body, a tip was called in to the Chillicothe Police Department identifying a potential person of interest. This was then 27-year-old Donnie Couchner Jr. From what I could gather, it seemed like Donnie's sister was living in a home with a roommate whose mother owned the home. Well, on the night of October 12th, Donnie's sister, Lisa, called her roommate, saying that Donnie did something crazy and came to the home covered in mud and blood. She said that she was gonna let him take a shower there. The roommate was not okay with this, telling her not to let Donnie in her home, but she did it anyways. I believe it was either the roommate or the roommate's mother who called police to report what happened. By the time officers arrived to the home, Lisa spoke with police and told them that her brother had just been jumped that night. That is why he was a mess. She claimed she didn't know anything else. She didn't help him with anything and she had no involvement. At that time, I believe they were unable to locate Donnie because he was no longer at the house. However, after more pushing and putting more pressure on Lisa, she did eventually admit to lying in her initial statement. She said that when Donnie came home that night, she took his clothes from him and dumped them in a trash bin at a neighbor's house. Police followed up on that, and they did end up finding the bloody, muddy clothing in the neighbor's trash. Then she admitted to cleaning up blood from the bathroom where Donnie took a shower. Finally, she did give up his location, leading to officers finding and apprehending him. Now, Donnie was someone who was also involved in the drug scene around the area. He has an extensive criminal history involving drugs, getting into fights, and things like that. After looking more into Donnie, they found that his sister's house was located less than 400 yards away from that substation near where Rebecca's body was found. Based on some of the articles I read, it seems like Rebecca may have known Lisa's roommate and possibly was involved with her with drugs. She may have owed her money at one point before her death. According to friends and family members of Rebecca, they had never heard Rebecca mention Donnie's name before, so it doesn't seem like he was a close friend or a known acquaintance of hers. That being said, we don't know the exact connection between how Rebecca may have known Donnie, other than the fact that his sister lived with a woman who knew Rebecca. It's very possible that Rebecca met Lisa and Donnie through the roommate on a prior occasion and maybe was friends with them, or at least involved with them. It's also possible that she met them the same night she died. We truly don't know for sure. Either way, the thought was that maybe Rebecca and Donnie got into some sort of altercation that night, somewhere near Lisa's home. This escalated to him full-blown attacking her. She tried to run away from him, but she got caught on that fence. It's possible that both he and Rebecca were drunk or on drugs that night, though it was stated that Donnie was not tested for any substances when he was apprehended. After finding Rebecca's body and now having a suspect in their custody, the investigation was well on its way. At this point, Rebecca's body had been sent to the medical examiner's office for an autopsy, and what was revealed was so shocking. We already know that she was beaten, but the level of brutality inflicted on her is just horrifying. As I stated, she had several injuries on her face, neck, and torso. She had cuts on her hands as well as defensive wounds all over her arms. Her jaw and nose were bruised and broken. She had five cuts on her face as well as two two-inch deep stab wounds on her face. She suffered significant injuries to her brain and spinal cord. It was found that Rebecca had also been badly burned on her back, so much so that it went through three layers of clothing, a sweatshirt, t-shirt, and an undershirt. It was said that she fought so hard that one of her bicep tendons was severed, while the other was almost severed. Her cause of death was determined to be the result of blunt force trauma to her head and neck. She suffered a brutal, violent beating. 
That being said, the ME stated that it's possible that she still could have run away after the beating because she wouldn't necessarily have died from her injuries right away. During the autopsy, a DNA swab was taken from Rebecca's vaginal area. This, along with Donnie's bloody clothing and that bloody rock, they were all sent to the lab for DNA testing. It came back that Donnie's DNA was present in Rebecca's vaginal cavity, as well as other DNA that was not actually sufficient for identification. So there were two DNA profiles in her vaginal cavity, but Donnie's DNA was definitely there. Then there was a shirt he allegedly used to towel off after a shower in his sister's home. That shirt, along with Donnie's jeans, both tested positive for Rebecca's blood. Then finally, the blood on that rock also belonged to Rebecca. At this point, it seems like we have plenty of evidence to connect Donnie to Rebecca's death. Her blood is all over his clothes. His DNA is found on her body. Finding all of this out also led investigators to believe that Rebecca's death was actually not connected to the other five women who had turned up missing or dead. This was an isolated incident carried out by a different perpetrator. Elliot was one of the big questions left hanging out there. Was this case connected to the missing women and the dead women here in Ross County? Now, we can tell you in that press conference, the law enforcement agency stepped forward saying definitively, no, they call this an isolated incident, but tragic nonetheless. A 31-year-old, as you mentioned, dead. And the suspect, 27-year-old Donnie Kokenauer Jr., he appeared in court this morning and got a $2 million bond. Now comes the process of putting this case together and trying to find justice for that 31-year-old. Today, we learned a little bit more of exactly how she died. Multiple blunt force trauma injuries to her head and neck. She also sustained injuries to her hands and arms, which were consistent with defensive wounds, indicating that there was a struggle prior to her death. There was a large rock, probably the size of an orange or a grapefruit, uh, in the area where we believe the assault occurred. Uh, that was bloody, and it certainly looks like it could be the murder weapon. This is not at all related to the missing women. Um, as I've said before, bringing these miss missing women home, closure to this case is a tip away. I hope people can see that this tip that we received last night uh, solved this case. Based on all the evidence we've discussed up to this point, by November of 2015, Donnie Couchner Jr. was charged with Rebecca's murder. Of course, Donnie pleaded not guilty to these charges. After being arrested and charged, though, it was actually argued that Donnie was not mentally capable to stand trial. Over the course of several months, Donnie was examined three times by various psychiatrists, all who believed he was not competent to stand trial. During this time, he was diagnosed with a speech and sound disability, which made it difficult for him to communicate. He was also diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder and substance use disorder. It was said that he likely suffered brain damage due to his extensive use of drugs, which started around the age of 10. However, as he spent more time in jail, he was no longer able to access drugs and was being treated for his various mental health issues. So finally, in his fourth mental health examination by July of 2016, a psychiatrist found him fit to stand trial. Then it took almost another year for this case to finally go to trial, starting in April of 2017. The prosecution in this case brought forward all of the evidence we've discussed up to this point. The thought was that Donnie and Rebecca got into a fight for whatever reason. It was stated that it's possible that Lisa, Donnie's sister, and Rebecca had been fighting over some boy, but Lisa denied that claim. Otherwise, it's possible that this dispute was over drugs or something like that. We do know that his DNA was found in her vaginal cavity, so it's possible that they had a sexual relationship and something went wrong. Either that or he assaulted her. No matter what the fight was over, Donnie ended up beating Rebecca with a rock and stabbing her in the face. I'll spare you from hearing all of her injuries again, but as we heard from earlier, Rebecca suffered a great deal of horrific injuries causing her death. She managed to escape only to get caught on a fence where she got stuck and died. After this, Donnie ran to his sister's house, located only 400 yards away from where she was found dead. There, he showed up in bloody, muddy clothing. He took a shower, and his sister helped out by throwing away his clothes and cleaning up the blood. 
Despite her efforts to help her brother though, these clothes were found and sent for DNA testing, all which came back as positive for Rebecca's blood. All of this points directly towards him being responsible for Rebecca's brutal, violent murder. However, the defense claimed that someone else was responsible. They explained that on the night of the murder, Donnie and Rebecca were at a bonfire with a bunch of other people. The party got rowdy and some things got out of hand. They said that there were plenty of people at that bonfire who disliked Rebecca, many people who had a motive to hurt her. So yes, Donnie's sister lived near where her body was found, but there were tons of other people in that area near the fence as well who also could have been responsible. At the trial, Donnie actually did take the stand to testify in his own defense. He claimed that both he and Rebecca were homeless on the night of her death. He said that the two did have sex that night, but they got into an argument after. He said that she bit him, so he hit her back. But that is all that happened. It didn't escalate past that, and she went on with her night afterwards. There was one witness who testified for the defense who claimed to have attended that bonfire. He said that his memory is foggy because he had been drinking heavily and he too got knocked out in a fist fight that night. But he claimed that before he was knocked out, he saw Rebecca leaving the party and heading into an alley. Another woman followed her into that alley and he saw the woman pin her to the ground and start hitting Rebecca. Lisa, Donnie's sister, also testified at trial. She admitted to lying to police and trying to cover Donnie's tracks, but she said she didn't do that because he is guilty. She did it because she too is addicted to drugs. She heavily used meth and heroin and all she ever thought about was getting her next high. She lied to police because of her drug addiction. She would have lied about anything. But now that she's clean and off of drugs and has a clear mind, she understands why it was wrong to lie and is now telling the truth. She continued that she does not believe her brother was guilty because he would have told her if he was. I do want to mention that Lisa did spend a year behind bars after being charged with evidence tampering and lying to police. But by the time of the trial, she was clean and off of drugs, according to her. Based on what we've heard up to this point, it really sounded like the prosecution had a rock solid case. DNA evidence that links Donnie to Rebecca. The fact that his sister's house is located right by where her body was found. How he came home that night covered in mud and blood. However, on the other hand, there is still that small possibility that someone else present at this bonfire could have been involved. Maybe Donnie really did just sleep with Rebecca. They got into a small altercation leading to a bit of blood being shed, but that's all that happened. It seemed that there were tons of fights and brawls going on at that bonfire and many people who had it out for Rebecca. Maybe this case wasn't as rock solid as it seemed at first. So, after almost a week of trial, both sides made their closing arguments and the jury was sent off for deliberations. They deliberated for three hours the first night, then another eight hours the following day before telling the judge that they were deadlocked. The judge sent them back to continue deliberating, which they did. After a few hours of deliberations, the jury came back and said that they had reached a verdict. They decided that Donnie Kouchner Jr. was not guilty of the murder of Rebecca Cade. There just was not enough evidence to say for sure that he was the one who took her life in such a brutal way. He was exonerated and after spending almost two years behind bars, Donnie was a free man. Of course, Rebecca's parents were devastated and heartbroken when the verdict was read out. They really thought that they were going to get justice for their daughter's death, and now that was just being ripped away from them. And as far as I found, investigators haven't really said whether they will pursue other suspects or if they feel that Donnie was the only one who could have done this. After being released, Donnie went on to be charged with arson after allegedly setting fire to a building he was in. Then, about six years after being acquitted of those murder charges, 34-year-old Donnie Couchner Jr. passed away unexpectedly. I haven't been able to find any more information about how he died, but it doesn't seem like a suspicious death or anything like that. I don't want to make assumptions, so I'll just leave it at that. But if you do believe that he's responsible for Rebecca's death, at least he's not around to commit any more crimes like that. But that is all of the information I have on today's case. 
This case was definitely a wild one to research. I wanted to get a Halloween-ish case out to you guys this year, and when I saw this one, I was honestly shocked that a real human body could be mistaken for a decoration. Again, it seems stranger than fiction, but it really happened. And seeing how all of this played out, I guess I can see how this is possible. I'm glad I ended up covering this case regardless because Rebecca's story deserved to be told. I'm heartbroken that she went through something so horrific in her final moments. It's always hard to hear about people who end up in these bad situations like Rebecca because you know there are people out there who feel that they're somehow responsible for their own deaths. But what happened to Rebecca was just brutal and she didn't deserve any of it. I do personally believe that Donnie is responsible. I think the evidence shows that, and I think it would be far too much of a coincidence for all of those things to be there if he wasn't responsible. However, I do understand that there is some reasonable doubt there, so I can see why the jury acquitted him. But now I want to hear what you all think. Do you think Donnie was guilty? Do you think someone else was? Why do you think the jury came back with a not guilty verdict? Do you think you could have possibly mistaken a body for a decoration? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.